Thank you very much, Heaton. Um, I should say, as you can see at the beginning, that um, although I take responsibility for this talk, it is actually based on work that I'm doing uh, together with Dominic Abrams at the University of Kent and Curtis Jessup at uh, NatSEN. Um, one of the uh, things that um, many of us had to think about um, in the early weeks of the pandemic was how do we chart the impact of the pandemic on public attitudes at a time when it's no longer possible to do what uh, NatSense British Social Attitude Survey has traditionally done in order to do its annual survey, uh, which is to knock on people's doors. That, of course, became impossible during the pandemic. Um, British Social Attitude has happened, but it happened in a different way, but I'm not going to talk about it this afternoon. Um, what we did come up with, uh, funded by UKRI stroke the ESRC as part of its COVID-19 emergency response, um, was to use a uh, panel that uh, Natsen had already created, already been using, which essentially consists of people who originally responded to the British Social Attitude Survey. So it is therefore a random probability panel, uh, not one that uh, people are volunteering to join. Um, uh, but uh, using that panel uh, in order to chart attitudes, first of all, in the summer of last year, and again in the summer of this year. And these are all people who had responded to British social attitudes in either 2018 or 2019. So in many cases, we've also got measures of their attitudes at that point in time as well. But essentially what we're doing, very simple design, apart from that was uh, basically to ask a very large number of questions, nearly all of which had previously appeared on British social attitudes. So we can address, as it were, the kind of big question that's out there. There's been a lot of elite commentary about how the pandemic uh, potentially represents a reset moment, an opportunity to rethink the way in which society is run and is organized. And we're kind of asking the much more prosaic question, well, but hang on, has the structure of social and political attitudes changed? In particular, I'm going to focus on two questions here. The first is, as we've already said, there's been a lot of talk about inequality uh, during the pandemic and the, fact, the feeling that the pandemic unveiled some of the inequalities that exist in the United Kingdom. But does this mean that, so far as the public is concerned, there is now increased recognition uh, of that Britain as being an unequal society and a wish to make it somewhat less unequal? Uh, the second thing, certainly, of course, is that um, the pandemic suddenly meant that a lot of people who probably thought they were in relatively secure jobs um, suddenly found that they were being furloughed. And therefore, has the exposure to economic uncertainty, uh, particularly the exposure by people who probably thought they would never, ever be dependent on the state, at least during the course of their working lives, has that increased support for welfare provision? And of course, welfare provision has been one of the uh, controversial issues during the course of the pandemic itself? Or is it actually the case that despite all that elite commentary, when we come out of the pandemic, we'll be looking at a society that's very similar in its attitudes to what it was previously, not least because people look and interpret the COVID world through very much the partisan lens that they had beforehand. So let me just walk you through the evidence we have on these two questions. And note that um, because we're looking at questions that have been asked regularly on British social attitudes, we cannot just address the question of, well, are attitudes now different from what they were in 2018 or 2019, but also ask whether or not the character of attitudes we have now are in some way or another unprecedented uh, uh, as compared with the last 30 or 40 years ago, ever since British social attitudes started in 1983. So exhibit number one in that respect is a question that's asked regularly on British social attitudes, which asks people whether they agree or disagree, whether there's one law for the rich and one for the poor. It's part of a suite of items that we use to measure whether or not people are essentially uh, inclined to be left-wing, concerned about inequality or right-wing, rather more concerned about uh, creating incentives for entre entrepreneurs. Now, uh, point one to note, if you look at the two right-hand dots, those are the two of our post-COVID surveys. 
you will see there has been some increase in the proportion of people who agree with this proposition as compared with the immediate period beforehand. That said, it's still not as high as it was for much of the period when uh, Lady Thatcher and John Major were Prime Minister, uh, because the agreement with this proposition tended to decline during the uh, era of New Labour. So um, some perhaps sign here of uh, increased recognition, but of course we might say that perhaps this is an item where some people's views got confused with the fact, the charge that's made against the Conservatives in the wake of the Dominic Cummings affair, um, that uh, they think it's one law for them and one law for everybody else. So perhaps we should be looking at another measure. So slightly something more direct. Ordinary people get uh, don't get their fair share of the nation's wealth. Something that's not really changed very much over the years. You can see there's a little bit of an uptick, but it's not dramatic. And it's certainly it's not an uptick that's indicative of a radically different society with a radically different outlook as compared with the last uh, 30 years. Um, but of course, what's also true is that um, it might be one thing to say that it's rather unfortunate to uh, that we live in a society is rather unequal. It's another thing to go on to say, well, actually, the government should be redistributing income from the better off to the less well off in order to correct it. Now, you can't tell this uh, directly. The um, uh, y-axis here is different from the previous two. With the previous two slides, we're, we were bouncing around the 60 percent mark. Here, we're bouncing around the 40% mark, i.e. point number one is it's always been true that the proportion of people who think the government should be doing something about inequality is less than the proportion of people who seem to recognize a degree of inequality in our society. The second thing you will note is that there isn't much sign in our two uh, uh, post-COVID surveys that support for redistribution is any higher than it was immediately beforehand, and it's certainly much lower than it was in the days of Lady Thatcher and John Major. So it's not clear here, even if we say there's something a bit of an increased recognition of inequality, that this is necessarily translate into a public that wants more to be done about it. Now, we can go on and, and look at this a bit further. There, there are two or three other items that are form part of this left-right scale. So let's now start, look at it as a scale. The lower the score, the more left-wing people are, 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 the higher the score, the more right, the more right-wing they are. Uh, so the two post-COVID surveys are on the right-hand side. And you can see the average score is a little bit lower than it was in each of the years from 2015 through to 2019. So to that extent, uh, taking the items of the scale as a whole, there's a bit of a move for left, a bit of a recognition of inequality. But you will notice that uh, just picked out here in 1996 at random, but it's basically indicative of much of the 1990s. That still leaves us in a position where the average scale score is higher and therefore more right wing uh, than it was in the 1990s. Where things may have shifted a little, uh, and this gets us back to understanding why attitudes haven't necessarily shifted a great deal in aggregate, is that the political division about inequality may have widened so much. So what I'm now showing you here are the scale scores separately for conservative and labor identifiers, and also those who don't identify at all, who, as Paul has already told you, are basically the largest group now in our society. And you will notice that basically um, it, amongst labor identifiers, the average scale score in our two COVID uh, 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 surveys is somewhat lower. But on the conservative side, there's no sign of any change at all. Um, and those without any identity, it shifted it as well. So probably the, the political division has opened somewhat. But here's a reminder that for those who are already fairly strong supporters of a party for whom uh, concern about inequality is not something it's traditionally associated with, they've not really departed from their pre-pandemic view. Okay, on to my second principal question, which is to do with attitudes towards welfare. Um, and are we as a society now more supportive of welfare, and particularly supportive for welfare of those of working age than in the past? Well, uh, the first thing uh, to say, uh, in case it's something you're not aware of, 
um, is that we've, uh, in contrast to some of the other items I've shown you so far, when it comes to attitudes towards welfare, these have been much more, have uh, changed these much more dramatically during the course of the last 30, 35 years. Um, and in particular, there was a dramatic change with the advent of Labour in government, a, a Labour government that was very much fixed on the idea of welfare to work, a, 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 a government that criticised the previous Conservative administration for spending as much as it did on welfare rather than trying to use the welfare system to get people in employment. Now, this is one of many items. This is saying if welfare benefits weren't so generous, uh, people would learn to stand on their own two feet. And you will see with the blue line, the proportion of people who agreed with that uh, measure rose very dramatically during the new Labour era uh, and became very clearly the dominant view. You will then also see, however, in the four or five years leading up to the pandemic, our attitudes towards welfare started to become more liberal again. So even before the pandemic, we were looking at our society, which was less critical of the welfare system than it had been. It's not actually shifted very much thereafter. You can see the, the two, we've got a couple of blue dots that are slightly above a uh, proportion who agree, it's slightly more than proportion who disagree, but it's not essentially changed during the pandemic. But what is therefore true is that when we entered the pandemic, we were somewhat more liberal about welfare, although not as liberal as the 1990s. And that therefore probably meant that we already had an environment in which somewhat greater government support for those of working age was somewhat closer to the public zeitgeist than it certainly would have been a few years ago. But it's that that's been going on rather than necessarily attitudes uh, uh, of the public changing during the pandemic. Now, just to show this isn't just something to do with one item, here's another item. Uh, um, uh, most people who are on benefit you, you, uh, usually don't uh, need, need the help. The blue line is agree. Again, you'll see the same pattern, the movement in a less liberal direction in the new Labour era, the uh, rise in uh, the, the change in attitudes in the lead up to the pandemic, with us again becoming more liberal uh, in, in people's responses. But again, basically, attitudes in 2020, 2021 are not different really from what they had been uh, in 2018, 2019. Uh, uh, um, what, however, again, where there may have been a, de a degree of change is in the political division. You will see here again, this is showing the percentage of people who agree with the first of those two items. And you will see that amongst Labour identifiers, certainly their relative liberalism has been maintained. If anything, it may have gone a little bit further. In contrast, conservative identifiers are now somewhat uh, less liberal about welfare than they were immediately before the pandemic, although both groups are, uh, are more liberal than they were um, back in 2015. And again, amongst those who've got no ident identity, not much change. So there may be something in a political division here, but again, an indication of how prior predispositions potentially matter. Um, and again, just to show it's not something to do with one item, a very similar pattern with our other item about whether or not people who are on social security don't really deserve help. Now, finally, in the, my, my last six minutes or go, I'm just going to drill down a little bit more uh, into looking at particular aspects of the welfare system, and in particular, uh, which aspects of welfare people may now uh, may or may not be more supportive of. Um, one, you know, welfare, of course, does cover a, a wide variety of things, and a large proportion of the welfare bill is actually to do with people who are retired and, and the old age pensions. Um, and of course, one of the uh, crucial features of particularly the attitudes of the Conservative Liberal Democrat coalition towards welfare was actually maintaining the triple lock and not trying to reduce the expenditure of welfare on those in retirement, but rather focusing it very much on those of working age. It was working age benefits that were being gradually squeezed uh, whereas those who are retired were not. And for a long time, this reflected public attitudes. So, you know, exhibit number one, 
give people a, a asking people whether or not the government should spend more or less on benefits of retired people for a long time. Around a three quarters of people were saying, yep, yeah, absolutely. This actually was already beginning to change during the era of the coalition. Um, now here, my last reading before the pandemic is 2017, but the pandemic hasn't really changed things. In contrast, as you will see, attitudes towards spending on benefits to the unemployed, while they became less liberal uh, during the era of New Labour, um, and were so in the early years of the Conservative Democrat coalition, but as you might now have expected, although here the last reading is 2017, you can see there were already signs of actors being more liberal, um, and they're certainly more liberal as they were in 2017 now. Uh, almost as many people are saying more should be spent than less, but you know this is basically what we would expect given what was going on beforehand. Uh, and indeed, I can then also show you another measure, which is uh, where we've got, it's been asked more regularly, asking people whether unemployment benefit is too high or too low, again, a familiar pattern. Uh, under Margaret Thatcher, they said it was too low. Under Tony Blair, they said it was too high. It, it was already in the years running up to the pandemic, the proportion of people saying it was too high was diminishing. That's simply been maintained during the pandemic. It's not moved on further. So we're still not as liberal on this subject as we were under the uh, uh, conservative governments of 79 to 97, um, but we are in a relatively liberal environment. And finally, on this uh, level of um, uh, detail, um, well, first, first of two things, again, looking now at the extent to which, um, what are people's attitudes towards uh, the unemployed as a group, uh, the first of these is looking at uh, whether or on, uh, people think that most unemployed people can find a job if they really wanted one. The pandemic has not really changed this, though, of course, so far, uh, the pandemic has not actually re re resulted in the high levels of unemployment that perhaps we anticipated. On the other hand, what you will notice is that one of the things that also was changing in the run up to the pandemic, but has not really changed since, is a decline um, in the sense to which people were stigmatizing those in unemployment. This is an item that says most people on the dole are fiddling in one way or another. That's something which has already be have become less of concern. But again, it's not a question of the pandemic changing things as simply maintaining things as they were. Finally, and again, just to emphasize how, so far as the welfare system is concerned, and despite the discussion about uh, particularly inequality and the difficulties of people on low incomes, it's not clear that the pandemic has uh, uh, raised the, uh, the appetite for spending more on people on low incomes. This is the lower of the two lines here. It was more liberal before the pandemic. It was already more liberal by 2017, but it's not markedly changed in the wake of the pandemic. I meanwhile, spending more for uh, single parents, well, frankly, that's just pretty much fat line. Finally, I've just got time to look at one subject which has uh, been the subject of recent uh, interest because the government has come up with something of a policy on the payment of social care. And of course, it's something that particularly got raised during the pandemic uh, because of the way in which uh, the COVID-19 had a high impact in terms of mortality and morbidity amongst those living in care homes. Um, so a question that we've asked on a number of occasions relatively recently, and we've asked it twice during the pandemic, is asking about who should be paying for social care. Um, we essentially gave people the choice of the government just paying for the whole thing, the individuals paying the whole thing, the individuals paying what they can, and then government can pay the rest, which is essentially designed to reflect the current um, uh, uh, position in England of people paying until basically their assets are pretty much squeezed. Then also we say, but you know, should the individuals pay up to a capped amount, and then the government should pay the rest. So that's trying the system to which more and more switch now England is going to move. So where the public stand on this? Well, one of the things perhaps you might have thought has happened in the wake of the pandemic is that support for the government paying the bill would have gone up. As you can see, it has a blue line. It's a portion of people who thinks the government should be paying everything. That has not gone up. 
What actually has gone up is support for caffeine. So the current system is not particularly popular, only around a quarter of people back that, but caffeine has emerged as the single most popular of the um, uh, options. And the interesting thing, the group amongst whom it's particularly popular, it is conservative identifiers. And my, I suspect that what's going on here is that capping is, uh, hits the sweet spot between, on the one hand, conservatives who don't think the state should be paying too much and therefore are reluctant to see the state paying for things. But on the other hand, are concerned about the potential impact of social care on their, on the, on their assets um, and therefore capping provides them with the option with which they are comfortable. Um, so perhaps that's why we've ended up where we are. So broad message is, well, we may not have had a lot of liberal elite commentary about how the pandemic is going to create an opportunity for changing society. The truth is that so far as policymakers are concerned, it looks as though they're going to be facing a public that looks very, very similar to the one that we had on these two issues, at least two years ago before the pandemic.